Good morning. Uh, it's Tuesday, and I'm here recording um, our last lecture of this semester. So I've already kind of quasi said goodbye to you guys during the last uh, day of live class on Thursday of last week. Um, today, uh, we, we're going to cover a, a, a short but very theoretical topic. It's what I think of as the real paradox that has developed over the last 30 years of this era of globalization um, that, that we have been in. So this globalization paradox is going to lead to a dilemma of political and global institutional choice. Um, and I said dilemma that that um, actually is, is more accurately described as a political trilemma. So those are the big concepts for today. Um, pay attention closely to this because I do think this would make a, a decent exam question. And the globalization paradox is very simple. Let's start with a, a very simple question. Can global markets, so that is economic globalization as we've come to understand it over the last seven weeks, nation states, which you will remember I established as being kind of the, the political building block of the global system, the institutional system, and national democracy coexist. So what we are doing here is trying to connect economic systems with political systems with the creation of those political systems, right? Like market globalization, nation states, and democratic election of representatives within those nation states. So hopefully that makes sense so far, right? Those are the three things that, that are going on here. And there is a belief, and I think a fairly... Uh, intelligent belief, actually, um, that there might be a fundamental incompatibility between these three things, which I'll flesh out over the next 20 minutes or so. We know that capitalism, as we understand it, and as we practice it, tends to work best when it is done under free and fair conditions. Now, that raises an important question. People always connect those two, especially when they're talking about elections. Well, the election needs to be free and it needs to be fair. Why do those two things always get connected to one another? Um, certainly there's a moral judgment that's happening because we want things to be free and fair. Hey, I get that. I understand that. When you are talking about capitalism, though, there are some that are starting to argue that free doesn't necessarily imply fair. And in fact, free markets can end up eroding the very fairness of the market system that you are trying to make free. And that's a paradox, right? That's a fundamental incompatibility. So even though, and, and, and that's baked into the very system of capitalism, over time, even though we know it works best under free and fair conditions, over time, if you let it go unregulated, it can produce skewed and destructive markets and unfair conditions. So it, it works best under fair conditions, but if left unregulated, the system will produce unfair conditions. So this is in some ways just a more theoretical extension of something I know I've said a bunch of times over the last seven weeks, which is that if you have a high level of economic inequality within a society, that tends to produce and breed political inequality as those who have developed a very serious economic advantage within a society takes political steps to protect that advantage, even at the cost of the very stability of the country and society that they live in. So since the collapse of the Soviet Union, it has been, it's been 30 years now since the Soviet Union collapsed. 30 years since the Berlin Wall fell, 30 years since Rocky ended the Cold War and David Hasselhoff sang on top of the Berlin Wall and the world appeared to be united in a system of global capitalism and national democracy and um, national sovereignty. Are those three things actually compatible with one another? I wonder. So it's been dogma for a while. The really the accepted international dogma among the shot callers globally is that globalization is good and more of it is better. 
And anything that encourages global economic connections is to be prized and prioritized. This has been the dogma for a long time. Is that true? That's the question here. Is that true? And in order to answer that, I want to turn my attention to this idea, what's known as the political trilemma. So that's going to be a paradox that exists within three uh, or among three elements of a question. Here's the basic idea. There is a real incompatibility among hyperglobalization, national sovereignty, and democracy. So I've been kind of previewing this and setting it up over the last 10 minutes. But once you pit these three against one another, you end up with a situation where it's impossible to create a, a closed triangle because you can have two of these, but never all three. Once you choose which two of these you care about and which two of these you want to prioritize, by definition and extension, the third becomes unrealistic at best and impossible at worst. So let's take a second to define the, the concepts here and talk about what, and, and, and establish what we're talking about. When I say hyper-globalization, I am referring to unfettered free market globalization, right? The greatest amount of trade among countries, the lowest possible transaction costs across borders. It's neoliberal doctrine, essentially. Now, when I say national sovereignty, that means that we are going to prioritize having the nation state itself be still the building block of the global system. So countries, like in other words, we're not going, we might have a world economy, but we're not going to have a world government. You know, you keep the UN where it's at, you keep the IMF where it's at and, and, and continue to have these um, transnational institutions. But national sovereignty, right, countries are still going to be in charge of their own affairs, which seems to be what most people want. And then third, democracy, right? Countries are going to, not only are countries going to be sovereign, they are going to be chosen, right? Or the leaders, pardon me, are going to be chosen through a democratic way and their policies are going to be unfolding through a democratic way. Are these three things compatible with one another? Any two of these are compatible with one another. But what I hope to show you today is once you choose the two you care about, the third becomes something you can't have. So up to the up to this point, you know, over the last 30 years, we've tried to split the difference among all three. And that might be over now. That might not be something that we can realistically do going forward. So we've had hyperglobalization and people are really bristling now at things like un unregulated foreign investment and um uh, outsourcing and offshoring that causes job loss and virulent economic inequality uh, that's been baked into the system. So there's problems there. National sovereignty is something that we always profess to care about, and yet more and more power needs to be given over to international institutions to solve problems that are bigger than any one nation state climate change being the most pressing example of that. And then democratic po uh, politics, you will remember from a few weeks ago, I, I uh, explained how there hasn't been a meaningful increase in the proportion of the world states that are democracies in the last um, 20 years, right, since, two, since the year 2000. So there's been a real stagnation of democratic progress. And I wonder if the reason why all three of these things are kind of generating pretty intense backlash from populations and individuals and sometimes entire nations is because of this, this issue. We have tried to have all three and you can't. And that's over now. And we're going to have to pick which two we care about. So let's go through the three options. If we have, th well, if we have three concepts here, then you will have three different possibilities presented to you of pairs between two of these three. So let's go over what your three options are. The first is something that people like Thomas Friedman, uh, if you know him, he's written a bunch of books, um, most notably a book about the Arab Spring that was a piece of trash, but whatever. Um, he, he has a good term for this, actually. I, I don't really like his Arab Spring book, but but I like the term he came up for this. He calls it the golden straitjacket. So what's a straitjacket? You put it on it and you can't move unless you're Harry Houdini and, and you know how to, how to, how to escape from it. 
And the fact that it's golden should tell you that um, there will be benefits to being put in a straight jacket. It might constrain your movement, but it will potentially allow you to um, get richer and, and to get more um, and to get more um, economic activity. Um, this far, I was kind of ripping on, on Thomas Friedman's um, Arab Spring book, but he wrote a better book that I, I think that, that that coins this term, the golden straitjacket, uh, called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Um, and uh, it looks pretty closely at the Arab world about like kind of this, um, on the one hand, you have consumer goods, the Lexus, and on the other hand, you have traditional culture, right? The olive tree and olive oil. So anyway, so with the golden straitjacket, here's what that looks like in practice. You are going to combine unfettered market global globalism with nation states that are the supreme units of analysis. So you still have nations, right? It's not like you dissolve the US and Canada and Mexico into some union or something like that, but you keep those countries as they are and allow them to trade in an unfettered way. And that means, though, that even though the nations are sovereign, their economics aren't anymore. Nations have to sacrifice some economic sovereignty to global institutions. And that might not be uh, possible with democratic politics. Many countries that exist in trade unions or trade affiliations are, are learning this. So take a look just at that like sort of North American example um, that I gave of the US, Canada, and Mexico. Those countries have very different economies. And so when you look at the United States, the types of things that, that we are going to be most concerned about is probably not going to match up exactly with Canadian and Mexican national priorities. And if we're going to have truly unfettered globalism, we're going to have to start making decisions in a non-democratic way because you're never really going to convince the Canadians and the Mexicans that they should just do things to help America's national interest. No, you can't convince them of that. You have to coerce them to do that. And so what this does is it introduces a tremendous amount of inequality in the system, and that's not very democratic at all. Another uh, really good example of this is the, is the European Union, which has tried to do exactly this. Create They have created the EU 27, the 27 countries of the European Union. That's the biggest economic block in the world, bigger than even China. It's 27 countries and some really wealthy ones. And so Europe now says we're all going to get rich by creating this common currency that 19 countries participate in and creating this trading block that 27 countries participate in. And you know what? It's even more than that, actually, because Britain is going to have to trade with them at some point. Like they'll cut a trade deal probably in Switzerland and Norway and, and, and you know, the, the emerging economies of the Far East, uh, Far Eastern Europe are, are going to have to, um, you know, work, work in this system as well. So it's a pretty big block. But that creates some really serious problems when you're dealing with um, the democratic concerns of individual countries. Because it's so many countries in Europe and because Western Europe is so much more stable, so much wealthier, and so much more just institutionally coherent than Eastern Europe is, it's really difficult to put those like groups of countries in the same block and expect them to all to see eye to eye. It's great when the euro is slaughtering the dollar and it's great when everybody's just making cheap money. That's awesome. But the second that they have a real problem on their hands, it all falls apart because like it, and, 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 and in order to reach any type of conclusion, you have to sacrifice democracy. So the story of Greece here is really illustrative. I've talked a bit about the Greek economy. Um, in 2011, Greece's economy absolutely exploded on itself. Um, you know, sovereign, sovereign economic crises are often framed in a way that's like really difficult to understand. What happened in Greece is actually really um, easy to understand, believe it or not. And it just starts with a very simple understanding of debt, of, of what debt means. So if debt, you know, debt is money you take on from somebody else and or some other institution, and then you have to pay it back. There's two types of debt out there. First type of debt is called collateralized debt. 
that is debt that is protected and secured with some type of asset. So think about money you may borrow to buy a car or money you borrow to buy a house. That's called a mortgage. So if I borrow money from a bank to buy a house and I don't pay the bank back, the bank gets my house. So that's debt, that's collateralized debt, which is protected with an asset that can be seized if the money isn't paid back. The second type of debt is unsecured, and that is protected with a promise. I borrow money from you, and I promise to pay you back. And if I don't, well, hey, life's full of disappointments, and this is just going to be one of them. When you, the consumer, or a household, right, your parents, let's say, borrow money, that's almost always collateralized debt. But when a country borrows money, it's almost always unsecured debt. And that's why countries get into so much trouble with the IMF. If they don't pay it back, it's not like the country itself can be seized. So assets need to be seized that never were meant to be protecting the debt um, thing in the first place. But the IMF is able to negotiate those types of really skewed deals with countries um, on behalf of multinational corporations. So anyway... Greece is a country that has always lagged really far behind Western European standards of wealth and productivity and living. So when Greece joins the Eurozone, essentially the golden credit of Germany gave the Greeks access to really cheap money they never would have had before. Essentially, like before the Greeks would have been borrowing money at like 10 to 15 percent interest. Now, all of a sudden, they get to borrow it at two to four percent interest, mostly because they were backed by being in the same currency union as Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium. So the Greeks get drunk on easy money and uh, borrow a crap ton of it. And the Greeks have a kind of a weird national culture where um pretty much nobody pays their taxes in greece like this sounds like a like a stereotype no it's actually true like nobody pays their taxes in greece um it's a, it's a weird value like if you if you don't pay your taxes in germany that is like a mark of shame if you get caught evading taxes like people will look at you as like how dare you steal from your neighbor like that. Like they don't look at that as like a sort of victimless crime against the government. They look at that as if you're screwing the very people you're sharing the German country and society with. Where in Greece, if you pay your taxes, it's sort of looked at as like, oh, you're not smart enough to figure out how to get away with it. You know, so, so Greece borrows all this money and then nobody pays their taxes. So Greece cannot pay this money back and the whole thing blows up. Um, now that creates a second problem in the spillover because when a country is experiencing a massive recession and Greece had 25% unemployment, 55% youth unemployment, like you barely have a country left at that point. And in the case of Greece, what tends to help a country in that situation, like if the market is too skittish to actually provide investment, the government has to do it. It has to guarantee and stimulate some economic activity at the start, and then that can build on itself. But in the case of Greece, I keep saying in the case of Greece, sorry, it's my crutch word right now. Um, in that case though, um, Greece, that's normally what Greece would have done. And Germany wouldn't let them. Because think about what that's going to do. If the government starts printing a lot of money to stimulate economic activity, that's what a, a wrecked Greek economy needed at the moment. But Germany is sharing the currency with them. So you flood the market with all this excess money, it's going to create this inflation, which, you know, Germans are afraid of inflation above anything else generally. So the Greeks are not allowed to do the very thing they democratically elected a government to do, which was stimulate the economy. Does that sound fair? Maybe it is fair. And it's a fundamental problem with this gold, like with this system of, 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 of a golden straitjacket. It's only golden if, ever, if, the, if the economy is healthy. And capitalist markets will always have boom and bust cycles. It is a nature, it's not a glitch in the matrix, it is a, a feature of the very system to have these boom and bust cycles. And the average Greek worker today is about as productive as the average American was in 1970. And now they're in a currency union with 2020 um, Germany. 
that's nuts. That's absolutely, in, that, that's insane. And there's no way you can create fiscal policy that is going to satisfy the Greeks and satisfy the Germans at the same time. So then the Greeks decide, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to leave the Eurozone then because this is hamstringing us. If we cannot do uh, our own sort of uh, democratically determined policy because of German and French and Belgian opposition and Dutch opposition, what do we do next? Well, maybe we'll just leave the Eurozone. Well, again, I, I said this, I think I told this story uh, uh, several weeks ago, um, but it bears repeating now. Changing currency is not as simple as just saying we have a different currency. You have to sell off the currency you have and then use that, like essentially that's used to then buy a new type of currency. So what that would do is flood the, the Eurozone with all these excess euros and boom, now you have an inflated economy again. And so... The Greek voters went to the polls and voted in a democratic free and fair election, there are those terms again, to leave the Eurozone. That is to exit this common currency and go back to the drachma, which was their old, their, their old currency. And the rest of the European blo Union blocked it. So that's why I say it can't, you cannot have democ uh, democracy in this system if it's going to damage other countries and if those countries can apply some type of weight to it uh to the to the smaller poorer country that's not very and is that fair i don't know maybe it is maybe it is fair because no one forced the greeks to join the european union in fact they practically begged to get into it so do we like democracy all right well why don't we say then all right we're gonna have national sovereignty and we're going to have global, uh, we're going to have democracy. Great. Okay. I, I can come in on this one writ large. This is kind of the system we had through the Cold War within the Western world, actually, was to try to link the Western world as much as possible, to do it by promoting democracy, you know, promoting democracy, um, and, and having a national, a system of national sovereignty. And what that does, you, you maximize democratic legitimacy at home. That's where you care about it. Forget about the Greeks and the Germans. They're just going to care about each other. And you minimize, try to minimize adverse spillover, right? Which that means um, negative effects of globalization, even if that makes goods more expensive, even if that means you have to pay more to import stuff from China or import, you know, leather from Italy or bananas from Costa Rica, whatever. Um, even at the price of transaction costs. This one's pretty easy to understand why there's an incompatibility here. If you care about uh, hyper-globalization, maybe you don't. Like, I think this actually, you know, gun in my head, I'd probably choose this one over the other, other two options. Globalization is just never complete at that point. And also keep in mind, like, you may be thinking after like seven weeks of listening to this class, you may be thinking like, well, would that really be such a bad thing? Well, for the lowest income countries in the world, it actually probably would be. Um, what this might do is freeze some of the most disadvantaged countries and cut them off from the type of investment that could actually really help them. Keep in mind that during this period, like we've had a tremendous increase in climate problems and, um, and uh, what was the other thing I want to say? Um, economic inequality throughout uh, the last several, uh, the last 30 years, this period of, of uh, globalization, this era of history. But at the same time, a billion people, yeah, billion with a B, have been lifted out of extreme poverty. And countries that used to have extreme gender inequality now have much more mild versions of it. Do not make the mistake of thinking that nobody has benefited from globalization except the elites of Western countries. No. China and India built a thriving middle class. Many countries in sub-Saharan Africa went from having life expectancies in the 30s to now life expectancies in the 60s. So a real system of globalization can drag forward countries that are pretty far behind at this point. And so I wonder, like, if you go for this option too, like with, which they call the Bretton Woods Compromise, named after a town in New Hampshire, um, it, this system that prioritizes national democracy and prizes that above all else, um, that's a system that, uh, I lost my train of thought there. What was I going to say? Oh, geez, last day and I'm losing it. Okay. 
Oh yeah. So that like that, that's a, you're basically telling countries that have not benefited from globalization that they can't benefit from it. And you're basically, th you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater at that point to use a phrase I'm fond of. Um, you're saying that because there's been an increase in economic inequality, we're just going to throw this all away. And to me, I, I will repeat something I said yesterday. I don't want to destroy capitalism. I merely want to hold it to a higher standard. And I don't think that, I do not believe that that is impossible. So if you care, if, you, if you're going to have national sovereignty and have complete democratic control of those countries, you can't have this era of this, this, this period of globalization and that might be worse than it actually sounds in practice. So that leads me to number three. That's the issue of globalized democracy. This is the world government type of system that you hear about in some really good conspiracy theories. There's an awesome conspiracy theory out there. I say awesome because it's one of those things that makes me laugh when I hear it, but uh, I just don't believe for even a millisecond that there's a conspiracy to create a global government because that will be a signaling mechanism to the aliens out there that we're ready for interstellar governance or one, something like planets have to be under uh, one government and not squabbling with each other, uh, whatever. Um, this system is really trying to embrace globalization, but you might be able to create the greatest amount of buy-in if you build it through a very democratically legitimate system. In other words, the, this system of national sovereignty, the nation state itself will become secondary to institutions like the, like the, um, the, uh, the World Bank and the IMF and the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. It's not that you create one world government, but you create a system in which international institutions become officially more powerful when it comes to dictating decision-making than individual nations themselves. And you do that through d democratic means, right? Countries <clears throat> participate and vote and you know so on and so forth. I'll repeat something I said during my lecture on the climate. To do this, to pursue option three, that of globalized democracy, you would have to create a type of governance <clears throat> that does not exist and that most people would actively reject. If people have bristled against mere intern, like, let me go back for a second. Um, this golden straitjacket where you have national sovereignty, but you have to sacrifice a little bit of national democracy, people have already bristled against that. Now here, this would be the type of thing that is actually a little more democratic, but would feel less democratic. Because people in the United States would be sharing that democracy with people in 190 other countries throughout the world. And that would certainly feel less democratic, even if it globally was more democratic. And that would certainly feel like the end of everything that we have come to know and accept about the world. So what do you do in this type of situation? I hope you can see how it, choosing any two precludes the third. If we want to have like a global de democratic form of governance, nation states don't matter anymore and they would never matter again. Um, and, and in fact, what we're seeing right now is more in, like in take a, take a look at the EU, which is the closest thing we have to this. In the European Union, countries are like the Brit, the Brit, um, the United Kingdom left the EU, but even if every other country stays in it, they're still negotiating less control of EU institutions and of Brussels over their domestic affairs. So the world, like a world, any system like this is probably a century away, and that means that even if you could have like a global, a, a democratic system, of global governance, like maybe, maybe that would solve the climate uh, issue. Climate's gonna be screwed by the time this ever happens. And I'm not convinced it ever will. So that is the political trilemma. Pick two, pick any two. What option do you choose? 
Do you want to sacrifice the nation state as the supreme unit? Do you want to sacrifice globalization as a profit mechanism? Or do you want to sacrifice democratic politics at home? And that's how I would think about this if I were you, right? Don't think about this in terms of the two you want. Think about this in terms of the one that you're willing to give up. That's what I got for you today, guys. Thank you so much for um, being a good class. I, I've really enjoyed teaching you guys and, um, and being your professor this semester. Um, let me know if I can be helpful. I do plan to get caught up on grading as soon as I can. And I thank you for your um, patience um, with me during, during this period. Thank you very much. Um, take care of yourselves, guys, uh, and be safe this break. Be safe. Right? Uh, if you want, if, uh, if there's anything I can do for you, um, you're always more than welcome to reach out. Bye-bye.